All right. Well, thanks everyone again for joining. My name is Lester Ali Tagteg, and I'll be uh, well doing the training today. Like Mike mentioned, uh, we'll be taking a look at the Leonard's Office uh, system, which is a 100% web-based LOS, uh, meaning you'll be able to access your loan files from any computer with an internet connection and an Internet Explorer web browser. Okay. So what that means is you don't have to have any particular piece of software installed onto your computer in order to access your files. So if you're working in the office or if you're remote location from home while traveling, you'll be able to log in online and access your files, look at updates and things like that. So what we wanted to do today is take a look at the lender's officer's perspective and take a look at some of the uh, common um, tasks that you'll be involved in. Uh, you know, originating, creating these loan files, running pricing through the Price My Loan engine, which uh, we'll get into a little bit more once we get there. Uh, then eventually submitting the loan over uh, to the processing team. And then uh, finally at the end there, um, you know, also how to generate um, or contact our uh, support team if you do have any questions. So uh, with that, the first thing that you'll want to do once you know. have obtained your login and password is go in here to the Lenders Office website. Uh, it's www.lendersoffice.com. You'll notice it'll redirect you to a secure uh, site. Uh, it has a HTTPS secure.lendersoffice.com there. But just for uh, simplicity, lendersoffice.com will work for you. And it'll bring you right here to this login page. Now, your administrators will be providing those login and password uh, information to you. And once you do get that, you'll be able to enter it here and get into your pipeline. Uh, one thing I do want to recommend before we jump into the system here is adding Lenders Office to your trusted site zone. It's just one setup item that we do highly recommend. Just uh, basically allowing uh, adding Lenders Office to trusted sites allows uh, our system and your web browser security settings to play nicely with each other. So just below the login uh, fields here, there's a little yellow box that tells you, uh, what gives you instructions on how you can add Lenders Office to the trusted site zone. Okay, so once you do that, uh, you should, might see something similar to the bottom right corner of my screen here, uh, where it says it is now part of trusted sites and not just the internet zone, uh, as they call it. Uh, but with that said, uh, we'll go ahead and log in, enter our login password information, and once you do that, you'll be taken to the pipeline screen. And it will look something similar to this. Uh, I'm using just one of our testing accounts today, so um, you know you might see things a little bit different depending on your settings or what's enabled on your account. Okay, but uh, for the most part, what we'll be covering uh, should look very, very similar and similar for you. Now, this is my pipeline. This allows me to see the loan files that I am currently assigned to, and uh, you know it's kind of in my responsibility. At least that's the idea. So by default, uh, we're using the simple pipeline uh, option right here, which means that uh, it's just going to show you all the active loans that are currently uh, in your possession or uh, that you are assigned as the loan officer. Uh, now, with that said, uh, that means uh, uh, well, I should mention that this pipeline can actually be customized as well, uh, meaning you can add and remove different pieces of information that are more relevant to you as a MLO. Okay, and so. Uh, you know, what you want to see could be different than what a processor wants to see, than what an underwriter wants to see, than what a lock desk wants to see. So customizing the pipeline is, is very key. Uh, you can add and remove uh, different columns here based on pieces of information from the loan file you want to see on your pipeline so you don't have to dig into the file itself. And then on top of being able to change the information you see, you can all filter out types of loans that you I'm want to sorry. see. sorry. That's uh, not yeah. a valid extension. Please try again. Okay. Apologize for that. There seems to be some uh, other uh, person that had a audio uh, coming through. Um, one thing that well, so I was mentioning, uh, what you wanted to do also is filter our pipeline so that we only see the loans that we're writing. You know, you don't want to see it on your pipeline anymore because you're not you know, particularly responsible for it, uh, we can do those types of filterings. Okay. Now, to change or customize your pipeline, you have access along the right side of the screen here. There's a little change link. 
Okay. Now on that change link, you'll be able to select from a variety of different reports that have already been created uh, for uh, you to use. Okay. Now uh, we have some pipelines for some underwriters there, um, but mostly if you do find that you want to have a pipeline specifically for you as a loan officer, you'll want to go ahead and if you have access to this custom reports area, you can go ahead and do so. I would recommend contacting your administrator uh, to create a pipeline specifically for you. That way, uh, you know, everyone, all MLOs will be able to benefit from uh, that particular uh, pipeline view. Okay, and really the idea there is to help focus your attention on loans that you're responsible for uh, and then, you know, once it moves out of your department, for example, then, uh, you know, it doesn't show up on your pipeline, not polluting it, etc. So whatever your preference is, we should be able to accommodate that via the custom reports and customize the pipeline. Okay, now with that said, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the very, very beginning stages, probably on the earlier stages. Uh, with the borrower, you have this tool called the Quick Pricer. And in this Quick Pricer, you have the ability to go ahead and specify a uh, basic scenario uh, information to obtain uh, basic eligibility and results. Okay, so uh, as you notice, there is just a limited set of information, and once again, we're just entering very basic information. So uh, ultimately, when you do get more information from the borrowers, uh, you know, credit report, perhaps. Uh, more information about their credit. Um, you want to run that through the full price model engine to get the most ac more accurate results and eligibility. Uh, for now, we're just entering just some basic information to define whether or not, or determine whether or not this is even a good prospect uh, for you. So you enter your information that they've stated to you uh, along the bottom here. You go ahead and specify. Uh, which types of products you want to see. In this case, I say I want to see 15 and 30 year fixed um, products, three year arms, conventional FHA. You can add and remove these things as appropriate, um, but by default, these are the ones that are more common. So if I wanted to remove the three year arm, for example, I just went ahead and unchecked it, and now when I click on price, it'll allow me to run this basic scenario, okay, across the uh, guidelines and overlays for the products that are being made available to you. And so what we see now are the um, uh, products uh, that we do qualify for based on this stated information. So we have all of your loan programs uh, grouped according to uh, the product type. So we have our 15-year fixed conforming, 15-year fixed FHA, and scrolling down, 30-year fixed conforming, etc. And what this is doing is going out and showing you uh, the rate and the prices here. Um, the price or point column is basically a negative number is a rebate. Positive number are points that the borrower would need to pay in order to obtain that lower rate. Okay. So with this, you also have the adjustments link. And if you click on that, it'll tell you if there are any pricing adjustments or pricing hits or incentives even uh, that you're receiving for this particular scenario. Okay. All right. So with that, um, you know, you could move forward with creating a loan uh, at this point, but I think we actually recommend that you create a loan via a template instead. That way all the default information that uh, you have uh, set up in your account, um, uh, set up in the templates that your administrators have done will go into those files. Okay. So uh, this allows you, you can run this quick pricer as many times as you want to, as many times as you need to, and that will uh, basically show um, you know, the results based on that scenario. Now, with that said, uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off and jump back to my pipeline and take a quick look at some other ways that we'll be able to um, get loans into the system. All right. So uh, along the upper left corner, uh, we have the Create Loan link, and this will allow you to create a brand new loan file. Once you click on that, you'll be given access to uh, view your templates. Okay, so my account just has access to a bunch of templates, but your I think yours will have a more uh, limited set. So you'll just be able to select on the appropriate templates uh, that you're trying to create. Let's say if this is going to be a conventional purchase, conventional refi, FHA purchase, etc. Uh, just click on the appropriate one, and that will create a brand new loan file for you. Okay. Um, also, instead of creating a file directly, if you had any existing 
files, you can also click on this Import Loans link. And um, you know, this allows you to import loans directly from uh, you know, your, your Calyx Point BRW files, um, if you had a Fannie Mae 3.2 file, or even if you, had, um, if you had run a file already through Desktop Underwriter or Desktop Originator, uh, you can even import directly from, those, from Fannie Mae based on the case file ID and your uh, Fannie Mae credentials. Okay, so that's just uh, some of the items that you will be able to do. Uh, let's say if we had chosen the Fannie Mae option, uh, I can click on the Select Folder button, and that will allow me to navigate or find that folder where all those Fannie Mae files are located. And then uh, basically along the very bottom of the screen, we can see all of those uh, different files here. All right. So one thing to keep in mind, uh, we're just going to kind of work our way down and see uh, what's happening down here. So after I've selected my folder, just working my way down, uh, for Fannie Mae files, you know, you don't have really any status information on the format. So you can choose, uh, you know, loan open, for example, indicate uh, that it will be placed in loan open status when it comes in. Uh, one thing that will be required for you, though, is uh, selecting a template here. So that way, the default settings in those templates will apply to those loans that you're importing. Okay. And lastly, before uh, we jump out of here is, this area where you'll be able to assign certain people uh, to this loan file. Uh, most important will be the loan officer role. You, this will be your name uh, as long as you have that loan officer role on your account. If you have more roles, you might see your name pop up a, a few times. Um, so you'll want to make sure that that is uh, assigned to you. And then what's pretty neat is that in each of your accounts, the administrators have already set up certain relationships. Uh, you can see here it says use LO settings or use the loan officer settings. Uh, basically, that means uh, when you import this file, it's going to automatically assign the processor, manager, and possibly an account executive or whoever they had set up uh, to those files so they can see it on their pipelines right away as well. Okay, So there's something to keep in mind. Uh, you don't have to remember all of these guys because some of them will be done automatically for you. And then, you know, eventually, uh, you know, the lock test will be uh, assigned uh, later on down the road. Okay. so. Very important, make sure your name is here. That way you'll show up as the originator. Uh, but when you're ready to go ahead and import something, go ahead and click on this link or whichever file you're trying to import. And uh, you know, select the template, for example. Click on Start Import, and that will allow you to bring that file in. Now, uh, with that said, uh, we've taken a look at how we can create or import files into a system. Um, uh, on your pipeline, if you wanted to access an existing file, just click on this loan name or loan number here, okay, uh, and click on the edit link, and that will go ahead and bring up a new window for you. Now, aside from your pipeline, you also have the ability to run a search uh, for your loan. So if we take a look here on the right side, we have the search area where I can run a quick search based on the loan number or the borrower's information, okay? And so if I was to go ahead and um, let's say run a search for last name of Garrett, for example, or I can even do this, uh, G-A-R, and I'll put an asterisk saying anything that starts with G-A-R will show up on my uh, results. So if I click on go, <laughs> that'll go ahead and show me uh, those files that start with uh, Garrett there. Okay. So with that said, uh, I'll just go ahead and pick up that file because that's the one I wanted to use today. If you want to jump back to your pipeline, just click the pipeline link along the top, and that will allow you to jump back there. So let's go ahead and take a look at the loan file itself. So finally, uh, we are in the loan file. I'm zooming in a little bit just to make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. Now, uh, the first thing you know, you'll be doing is taking uh, the application, getting more information for the borrower. And uh, the primary way, uh, there are two primary ways you can do that. Uh, you have these three folders here along the left side of the screen. Uh, you have loan info, subject property, and borrower info. And this allows you to go ahead and just jump down each of these links in order to complete that area of the 1003. It's all linked to the 1003, just different ways. In this, in this um, scenario, they're all categorized in a specific way. Okay, so uh, let's take a look here. Uh, just jumping down, this, this loan info screen that we see is uh, here that allows us to enter the basic scenario information, uh, you know, purchase price, appraised value, down payment, et cetera, note rate, et cetera. Okay, now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the screen just to describe some common uh, 
user interface items, uh, things that you'll see common throughout the system. We won't spend you know all this time on every screen, but some things I do want to point out because it'll be common. Uh, as we take a look here, uh, as we're entering information, uh, we have uh, let's say this loan amount field. You'll notice it is grayed out. It does not allow us to modify it. I'm typing on my keyboard. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. It's grayed out. And the reason is uh, for these grayed out fields, that means it's being calculated or coming from some other area of the system. Uh, in this case, I know it's coming because it's being calculated by the system according to you know, the lower of the purchase and appraised value and then uh, the down payment. If I was to enter, let's say, a 25% down payment, we'll notice the system will go ahead and recalculate that loan amount for me. Okay? Uh, but something else that you'll notice throughout the system, aside from these gray fields that are calculated or come from somewhere else, are these lock checkboxes. Okay, so if I click on this lock checkbox, that allows me now to go ahead and type in my own value. Instead of letting the system calculate it for me, I can type in my own value. Let's say it's three hundred and uh, uh, three hundred and one thousand dollars, for example. That'll recalculate the down payment to nineteen point seven three three, uh, etc. So. You can see here that lock text box allows me to go ahead and enter a specific value that I want to use instead of letting the system calculate it for me. Okay, and like I said, this is going to be common. That lock check box you can already see on the bottom right. There are two other ones right there, so um, you know just be aware of that. Uh, you'll see it throughout, and you know you'll you'll get used to it as you continue to expose yourself uh, to the to those files. Now, something else as we work our way down here is the proposed PITI information right here. And so we have this mortgage PNI, um, you know, it's being calculated by the note rate that we've entered and also the loan amount we have. Um, we'll also notice for other financing PNI, it's currently at zero dollars. Um, but we'll notice it's grayed out. So if we click on this blue link, similar to like, you know, surfing the web, you click on that blue link, it'll take you over to that next screen. Now, one thing I want to notice, I uh, want to point out here, is that I tried to move to another screen without uh, saving my changes. And so I received a prompt here, do you want to save your changes? If you say yes, it'll save the changes and move you over. If you say no, it'll discard the changes and move you over. If you say cancel, you're like, oh, no, you know, what did I change? I totally forgot. I'm not sure. Go ahead and click on cancel, and that will keep you on the same page. Your, your changes won't be lost. It'll just... decide to save them. Even on the upper left corner, so at any time we can go ahead and click on save. And why is it important to save? Why does it ask you to save? Uh, well, since this is a web-based system, uh, you know, multiple people can be looking at the same file and multiple people, a lot of people can look at this file on their pipeline. So really, as you are making changes or even as operations is making changes and they're saving these uh, this information on the file, you'll be able to pull up the latest data. So people are clearing conditions, maybe underwriting clearing conditions, updating appraisals, um, you know, things like that. You'll even be able to see those things as they're making those changes, as they're saving those changes. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and jump to other financing PNI. We'll notice here, it brings us just down here to this other screen, other financing info, uh, where I can go ahead and enter um, some information that will help affect uh, my uh, my CLCV and also what contributes to my proposed uh, PITI. In this case, I didn't enter a rate or anything, so it's not calculating another monthly payment. But notice that I did enter a current balance, and I already have some information here. And so if I look at my top right corner here, we have an area that gives you a, just a synopsis or summary of the different ratios on the file. In this case, we have LCV of 80%, the LCV of 81.334. Notice that if I take out my uh, other financing info. So this is if you had a second lien, a new one, or if you have an existing lien, if you uh, remove that and save it, everything drops back down to 80, so LTV and CLTV match. Okay, so this is where you enter the information for those subordinate liens. Um, if it's a new uh, second financing, go ahead and turn this on. If it is an existing lien, go ahead and turn that off. Yeah. So with that said, I'm going to jump back to my previous screen, clicking the back button on the upper left corner there. And this allows me to go ahead and jump back to my most previous screen, just like your web browser, the This Loan Info screen. Uh, now some other common items I want to point out that you'll see throughout the system are these little drop downs and percentages and dollar values. Uh, basically, 
uh, you have uh, these monthly payments that need to be calculated and we'll go ahead and calculate that for you uh, based on what you've entered here. So in this case, I have a loan amount um, at 1%. Uh, so it's going to go ahead and calculate the monthly value. Uh, you know, the loan amount times 1% divided by 12, giving you that 250. Uh, same thing for real estate taxes. And maybe instead of a, uh, a percentage value, let's say we remove that, we can just type in a dollar amount itself. And so in this case, it's going to go ahead and just use that dollar amount uh, for that monthly value. Or you can do a combination of the two. Just as an example here, of course, this is not uh, probably not going to be a real scenario for you guys. But uh, if I went ahead and said 1% plus 300, they'll go ahead and calculate that for me. Okay, so just something to keep in mind that you have uh, these percentage and sometimes even these dollar values to help um, determine uh, some values that are going to be used. Um, you know, you'll see this on the DFE if you were involved in just reviewing the DFE. Um, and then just working our way down here, uh, the next field we want to take a look at um, is the mortgage insurance, similar to other financing info. I went ahead and clicked on that blue link, and that will bring us over to the upfront MIP funding fee screen. Now you'll notice it's really just move, uh, navigating here within this loan info folder. So I can click on these tabs, click on those links, or even the stuff on the left side, and that will help move me over to the different areas. Now on this particular screen, uh, at the top part here, if let's say if this was a FHA or a VA loan, you would be able to go ahead and specify, you know, that uh, 1.5 or whatever that upfront MIP is, and the system will calculate that value. If it's going to be financed, you want to go ahead and say yes, this is being financed. That way, it'll be used to determine the total loan amount. Uh, the portion on the bottom here is the monthly MI so that contributes to the monthly PI proposed PITI payments. Uh, you'll want to go ahead and enter that information down here. Uh, but it's percentage, and then you also have a drop down, but this should be defaulted by your admins in the templates uh, to choose how this should be calculated. Okay? So you have your upfront, and then you have your monthly MI down here. And so that's just about what I wanted to take a look at uh, so far. Um, the rest, you know, the PITI information as you enter it here. Um, I think we've covered just about everything in Loan Info except for this Price My Loan link. This Price My Loan link allows you to access the pricing and automated underwriting engine. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll skip this. We'll, we'll jump back here in just a bit. Uh, I want to go over and just complete the 1003 uh, first, and then we'll jump back into the pricing engine. But we'll notice that we could jump directly into the pricing engine if we wanted to here. Uh, just moving down the next folder here, subject property, I'll be able to enter information on my subject property here. If there's any rental income on the subject property, I can go ahead and specify that information here as well. Okay. Now, uh, for your borrower info, info uh, folder here, if I click on borrower info, this allows me to enter information for my borrower. Uh, you know, most of the time, you will have a married borrower on uh, one application, so, you know, husband and wife. Uh, or you know, wife and husband. Uh, if you had a uh, non-married co-borrower, the typical setup for that is to have them on a separate application. And so, uh, one thing I want to show you here is that if you click on this Add and Swap Co-borrower link along the top here, that will bring you to the borrower co-borrower management screen. In this case, we can see we have two applications: one for Charles and then one for David. Okay. Now, if I wanted to add in a, another applicant, let's say, you know, the, uh, the cousin or the aunt or uncle wanted to be part of this loan as well, uh, I can click on this Add New Borrower button here. What will happen is it will create a brand new 1003 application within the same loan file, so everything is contained in one file, uh, but this allows me to go ahead and say, you know what, this is, uh, let's say, Bob Borrower here, okay? And so we have Bob, we enter his social, his uh, home, phone number, present address, former addresses, etc. But we'll notice that if we wanted to switch between applications, we can click on the uh, option list along the top here and just choose the name of the application we want to work on. So if I wanted to work with Charles, go ahead and go to Charles's application. If I want to work on David's, use David's application, et cetera. Okay. Now some other uh, management features as far as applications go, uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on that Add and Swap Code Borrower link again. Uh, this allows me to go ahead. And let's say, oh, you know what, Bob, my the uncle, you know, he doesn't want to be part of the file anymore. I can go ahead and just delete him entirely from the file. If by clicking delete this borrower and spouse, 
that will remove Bob from the application, okay, or from the loan file itself. So there's no more Bob on the file once this has been refreshed. Um, same thing here. If we notice for David and Donna here, um, some other options that we have. Let's say Donna should be listed as the borrower and David is listed as the co-borrower on that application. I can swap their positions here by clicking swap the borrower and spouse. And that would just put Donna as the borrower and David as the co-borrower on that application. Okay. If I wanted to just delete, uh, let's say just delete the spouse, let's say Donna is no longer part of this app, click on delete spouse and that will remove Donna from the file and uh, you know, she'll be going away soon. In this case, now we have only David on this application. Remove them entirely. And uh, if I wanted, oh, you know what, David's dropping off too. Delete this bar and stuff. Remove them entirely as well. The key thing here is whenever you're doing these delete options uh, is that you can't undo them. Basically, it, it, that's why it's asking you, are you sure you want to delete all that stuff data? It's confirming it, and then, uh, you know, once it's gone, it's gone because it pretty much saves it. So be very intentional when you start deleting people from the file. Okay. So with that said, let's jump back to the borrow info uh, folder here and uh, we'll go into the employment screen. Okay. So uh, once again, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them out. Um, there's a little questions tab uh, here on uh, the GoToWebinar panel and you're more than welcome to go ahead and ask your questions there. Here we go. Uh, let's see, uh, the borrower employment screen, uh, we have the primary employer information along the top. Uh, for each of these employment records, there's going to be a little self-employee checkbox. You can go ahead and mark that if appropriate. Okay. And so you'll enter the employer name, uh, address information, their position, your job, etc. And then your processors eventually, they'll even be able to send the VOEs for each of these items. They'll just enter uh, when those verifications are sent, ordered, received, or expected. Okay. Now, for any other employment records you need to have on the 1003, just click on the bottom here, click on the Add button. Now, we'll go ahead and add uh, additional uh, records uh, to my file. Okay, and so I can say uh, another employer here, and you know, enter my appropriate times where I worked here. Let's say from 2009, and let's say I still work there. I can click on this current employment checkbox here and that will uh, indicate present. And this is important for you to do here. Don't just type in present, but you'll want to use this checkbox because when this exports out to Fannie Mae um, you know, for the DO or DU or LP run, uh, that'll go ahead and make sure everything is linked appropriately. Okay, so very key. If it's current employment, they're still working there, go ahead and choose this box. With that said, uh, you can manage uh, these different items here as well. You'll notice this is a link, a uh, list of other employment records. If I wanted to move one up or move one down, depending on you know how I want it to appear on the 1003, you have those buttons here. Pretty straightforward. And if, let's say, this guy doesn't belong here at all, click on Delete, and that will remove that employer record. Okay. So with that, uh, you'll see this kind of... Uh, these buttons uh, common for the liabilities and REOs assets that we'll be seeing in a bit. So uh, we want to take some time to take a look at how that works here. So for now, let's go ahead and jump over to co-borrower uh, employment. Uh, this allows us to enter any employment records for the co-borrower, uh, the spouse on this application. Notice this is for Joan or Jane, Jane Joan. And uh, our primary on top, additional employment records on the bottom. Uh, if you had multiple applications, remember, you could have switched between applications to add all the employment information for those other borrowers. If David and Donna or Bob were still on the file, you could choose their name along the top here and enter their information here as well. Okay. So with that said, uh, let's jump over to the monthly income screen. Okay. Notice I can click on those tabs along the top or the links along the left side, whatever your mouse is closest to. Uh, let's see here. Uh, for monthly income, uh, we have uh, all of our income for this application uh, for the borrower. In this case, it's David and then for Jane along the right side here. And so we have blue links, blue links. That means it's going to take us somewhere. Just like a web browser, if I go ahead and click on that blue link, it'll go ahead and open up a new window for me. And it actually brings me to a monthly income uh, calculator. So, uh, you know, we need monthly amounts here. So if I was to go ahead and put in 
uh, let's say I make 25, uh, the borrower tells you they make $25 an hour and work 40 hours a week, uh, we'll calculate that month income of 43.33. Uh, if they make, um, let's say, $50,000 a year annual salary, we'll go ahead and calculate that month income. This case is 41.66. So uh, based on the information that you've entered here, uh, that will go ahead and, you know, you can use those different pay plans or whatever to help determine those monthly uh, amounts. Okay, so same for borrower and co-borrower, just enter the information. If you click OK, it'll carry that over uh, right there onto the screen. That's awesome. Okay, now uh, same thing is going to be true for overtime, bonuses, commissions, dividends, and interest. Go ahead and use uh, those calculators. Uh, one thing you'll notice here for net rent is that it is a grayed out checkbox or a grayed out field. That means you'll only be able to, uh, or this is coming from somewhere else. In this case, I know it's on the REO screen. Um, Notice you have a lock checkbox here, so if you go ahead and um, uh, use that, you'll be able to type in uh, the values. Okay, and uh, folks, I do hear some uh, background noise, so if uh, you want to go ahead and just mute your phones, um, that would be great. Uh, just some uh, comments from other listeners here, so appreciate uh, the meeting. Thank you. Um, if I click on net rent, uh, this would take me actually to the REO screen, and that's where this uh, income information is coming from. So we'll take a look at the ARIO screen just a bit, about two, three more tabs down. Uh, but to finish out our screen here for income, we have the, um, the other income, uh, basically, where you can choose from this drop-down list of, of items. And these are you know, the standard Fannie Mae items. You can also type in your own values if you wanted to. Uh, just note that when it gets exported out to Fannie Mae, because it's not part of the Fannie Mae format, it'll just get lumped as a other income uh, category. Okay, so you choose. You know, does this belong to the borrower or does it belong to the co-borrower on this file? Okay, B or C, and then you can enter your amounts here. Now, uh, the application total just for this particular file is shown right here. In this case, it's nineteen thousand three hundred ninety-seven. And if we had additional applications that also had income. We'll notice along the bottom here the total monthly income for all borrowers. That's basically everyone on the file. Uh, so if David and Donna were still there and they were making money, you know, we'll go ahead uh, and you'll see it right here. All right. So with that, uh, if we jump over to the liability screen, um, we'll go ahead and see uh, our liabilities on this particular file. So the liabilities here. Uh, you know, if you're starting a brand new file, this will all be blank. You can go ahead and if you wanted to add a liability, I can say, hey, this is a visa, a revolving account, you know, uh, some kind of balance, let's say 1,200, monthly payments of, uh, let's say 100 or so, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, so I can manually uh, add or, or modify these uh, liabilities here. Uh, but what happens is that, um, more commonly, instead of having to type in all these liabilities, you want to go ahead and order a credit report instead. Okay, and so uh, what we'd want to do uh, instead is go in and uh, order this credit report. So you have this button right here to order credit. Okay, and then from here you have a few options. Along the top, you have your credit reporting agency. You can choose. You can see your uh, preferred credit agencies at the top: CBC and Kroll. Just choose from you know whoever is most appropriate for you, um, whatever credentials you have, and then you can go ahead and order a new credit report as well. So if I wanted to order a new report, just select which borough you want to include, and then you know those check boxes, and we'll go ahead and order that report for you. Uh, you can also reissue an existing report if you've already ordered a report. Enter the report ID here, uh, and then some CRAs will even allow you to upgrade an existing. Uh, uh, existing single grade report to a tri merge uh, directly from within the lender's office. Uh, so if that option is available, this will open up for you. Okay, and then also so along the bottom we have your credentials. Uh, these are your CRA or credit reporting agency credentials with Kroll or CBC. So you enter that information here, click on submit credit, and will allow you to go ahead and do that. Okay. So one thing uh, I wanted to show you here for CBC is that if you are ordering or um, yeah, if you're ordering a new report notice that you can go ahead and pay with a credit card. So if you check that option right there, that allows you when you submit this credit request, you enter your credentials, it'll pop up a little window where you can go ahead and uh, enter your credit card information. Uh, otherwise, 
if this was not available, it would uh, just be uh, an invoice or however else the uh, CDC handles the billing for your account. But notice everything is tied to the credentials that you're using. Okay, so if you want to pay with a credit card, go ahead and use that option right there. All right, so let's see. Uh, if we went ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and order or reissue a credit report. Uh, I just have one here, just so we can take a look at what it looks like. I'm going to just give me a moment here to enter my interview password and stuff. Uh, click on submit credit request, and I hope uh, that should be good for us to go. Um, so. It's going out. Oh, I know. Uh, my credit report is only for Charles, and I have Jane on the file. So I'm just going to delete Jane soon. Uh, yeah, let me go ahead and just delete Jane real quickly here. Sorry, Jane. Got to go. And we'll jump back to the credit report. All right. So let's go ahead and order credit again, the issue credit. So what it's doing is going out to the credit reporting agency and uh, getting the information directly from them and it's importing that credit report, the visible version, and then also the raw credit data our system would be able to use for the eligibility piece in the price my loan engine. Okay? So what happened here? Uh, basically it detected uh, that there were some existing liabilities on the file and it's asking us what do we want to do. Hey, you have two options, you can delete them all uh, and just import the new ones from the credit report. So kind of blank slate, making sure everything on the file is from the credit report, or you can do the update existing and import new. Basically, it'll uh, if there's any matches, it'll update the information with the ones in the credit report and import any new ones that don't already exist. Uh, for now, I'm going to go ahead and choose delete existing and import new. And what's that, what that's going to do is go ahead and uh, allow me to view the credit report itself. I can see uh, the credit uh, information, uh, credit scores, trade lines, late payment, et cetera, okay? And if I close this out and I went back to my liability screen here, it allows me to go ahead and see uh, the liability screen, okay? Now, on this liability screen, uh, we have all the information that came in. Go to meeting. Um, uh, right now, you should be on the liability screen. Let's see here. I'm just going to pause my screen right now and see if that helps. Okay. Uh, Mike or, or Adam, are you able to uh, see the liability screen or are you still on the credit screen? Yeah, unfortunately, Lester, we're still stuck. It looks like it hung up on the credit screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and try something here. I'm just going to pause everyone's screen. I do apologize for the technical difficulty here. And let's go ahead and start sharing my screen again. Anything different uh, should be the liability. OK, uh, while we're waiting for GoToMeeting to kind of refresh for us, uh, I want to take uh, some questions here that we saw. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what happens when we print out disclosures? Do we have to go to each individual borrower? Um, uh, Mike, uh, could you advise, will the MLOs be uh, working on the disclosures, or will that be the responsibility of the processors? Uh, each branch operates a little bit differently, so it's really how your branch manager wants it. But the, uh, uh, the disclosures will all be forwarded. We'll go over the service section. And that will be off to Doc Magic, and then all the information from lender's office will be imported into Doc Magic, and the disclosures will all be printed from there. Once the whole file goes over, you'll see all your borrower's information go in there as well. Okay, and we'll take a uh, specific look at the uh, Doc Magic piece uh, later on in our training. Okay. Yeah, uh, another the question. Video, uh, the video with going over to Doc Magic uh, to do your uh, disclosures is 100% compliant. Uh, 
Doc Magic runs a compliance team for every state, every county, everything gets uh, populated right. It makes sure when you're sending out your disclosures, your booklets get attached to it, uh, your charm booklet or whatever, if you're going to send them electronically, those are done. Hope we're doing those now. The uh, it also uh, allows us the ability to do quick sign. -in. We had our first initial Doc Magic training for disclosures. Uh, we will have another one to go through it again, show you the exact steps. But uh, that's the beauty of using Doc Magic for the uh, upfront disclosures. Okay. Some other questions here. Uh, regarding the income for the um, you know the other income area, uh, yes, at this time there are only three extra lines. So if you had additional um, line items, uh, you can lump them in uh, in order to have them all uh, accounted for on the income screen. Okay. All right. Um, are you guys still frozen on that credit? Uh, screen or are you all on the liabilities now? Still frozen. Hmm. Okay. No, it's obviously your fault. The go-to meeting uh, issue. Uh, perhaps we should just launch a real quick go-to webinar and zip a uh, access code, and everybody can get on again. I don't know. Yeah, let's see here. Oh, you're blue screened at least. Okay, you might. Uh, it might start going through a, a little cycle here in terms of hey, what we're seeing. I see your mouth. I see stuff. I had a big hiccup. All right. So uh, everything must move in. We're on the liabilities area. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so uh, what we did, we had ordered credit, and it went ahead and populated our liabilities list with that information from the credit report itself. And so from here, uh, just just some information uh, that we can take a look at. Uh, we can indicate for each of these liabilities uh, whether or not they are a joint uh, trade line or if it's just a borrower or just a co-borrower on this file. You have the debt type, installment, mortgage, open, revolving, etc. Uh, you have uh, along the bottom, you know, the account holder's name, number, balance information, you know, and all this stuff should be coming over from the uh, the credit report itself. Um, something that's pretty neat uh, to see is that for any uh, non-mortgage trade line, um, one thing that's available is that you can mark certain items as paid off um, here. If I click on will be paid off, what it will do is mark this item as paid off and it will remove it from the DTI calculation. Okay, and so if I save this information here, We'll notice in my little summary area along the top, it says paid off yes, used in ratio no. Um, and then also, there may be some times where it will be paid off but still needs to be included in the ratio. Uh, you can go ahead and just turn back the uh, debt should be included in ratios option there, and then you'll see it'll say yes and yes there. Okay, so just something to keep in mind if that was something you need to mark off just for the DTI aspect of it. Okay. All right, so let's jump over to the assets area. Um, yeah, assets here. And we'll take a look at the assets you can enter. Same thing, very, very similar to what we've been looking at. Click on the Add button. You enter, you know, does it belong to borrower, co-borrower, or joint? What kind of asset is it? Checking, market money, uh, money market fund, trust fund, uh, you know, automobile, etc. I have a few already on my file. Enter the information. Notice all of these verifications can also be generated by the processors uh, for that as well. Okay, and uh, let's go ahead and jump over to REO. Uh, REO screen. This is where you'll be able to enter the other information for the REO properties on this particular file. Okay, if I wanted to add a brand new one, click on Add. Very similar, and I'll just say this is um, 555 uh, Rental Way, for example. Notice uh, when you enter a zip code information, it will go ahead and populate the state and uh, city and sometimes even the county information. And then you can go ahead and choose, let's say this is a single family residence um, and it's a rental property. I'll go ahead and choose that. I can enter an occupancy rate, let's say of 75% uh, uh, here for that 25% vacancy. 
And notice, I did not put anything right here. They're all zeros. And the reason for that is I want to link my mortgage liabilities to my REO properties. Um, that way, when it exports out to Fannie Mae for the DO or DU run, you know, it'll be linked appropriately and it knows which um, liabilities link to which uh, REO property. So if I jump here to my liabilities area, uh, here for my mortgage, my Chase mortgage on the top, um, there's a place where it says property address and it says select a March match REO. And so if I click on this, I can go ahead and say, well, this belongs to that rental away property I just created. And uh, to go ahead and pass over the balance and payment information, I click on this button, uh, explicitly labeled as Add Balance and Payment Info to REO. And now, uh, it did two things. One, it linked this property so that when it exports out to DO, it's all linked. And now, on our REO property as well, uh, if I click on Rent for Away, it has that mortgage amount and monthly uh, uh, mortgage payment there. So it's pretty neat. Uh, you can link multiple uh, liabilities to the same REO property if necessary, if you know there was some second financing or whatever it is, uh, but that is the method that you'll want to do there. And then, of course, if you want to enter additional, you know, if they had some rent, go ahead and put in, you know, 1500 or whatever it is, and uh, the system will calculate the uh, cash flow uh, for you. Uh, basically, it's taking the mortgage uh, occupancy rate times the gross rent minus your mortgage payment and insurance and taxes. In this case, it's a net income of $17. Okay, and then aggregately, uh, across all of our cash uh, REO properties, we can see that we have a negative 720, a positive $1,370. So what that means is that for our cash flow, uh, it is a net cash flow, positive cash flow of 597. And so that right there is what's carrying over to our monthly income screen we were looking at earlier. Okay, uh, and it's calculating that as 597. Uh, if we had, let's say, a negative cash flow across the board, uh, net negative cash flow for our REO, this would be uh, labeled as zero dollars. That's because uh, you know it's not an income. Uh, it'll still be used in the ratios, but it just won't be reflected as an income here since it's a negative amount. Okay, uh, let's see here. Any questions? Okay, looks like everything's still good to go. All right, no questions so far. Uh, let's jump over to housing expense. And this area here allows us to enter you know, our borrower's current residence information. If they are renting or if they uh, currently have a mortgage, go ahead and enter this information. Once again, all of this information carries over to the 1003. And that's all we've been doing really here is uh, completed the 1003 and we have ordered credit. Um, in this case, we finished the borrow info folder, and so a bulk of that 1003 data has already been completed. And so you have those easy to find categories where you can see that information. Uh, I mentioned there were two ways in the beginning of completing 1003. Don't worry, uh, that second way is going to be, we're not going to go through it all uh, into detail, but you have this forms folder here where you have a loan 1003 folder, which we can see there's a page one link. So this is actually an electronic version of the 1003. It's laid out very similarly to the paper application. And so if this is your preference, this is where you want to work in, this is where you're comfortable in, do it this way. Um, go ahead, click on page one, uh, fill out the information, scroll down, page two, and just work your way down each of these links to fill out the information. Page three, we have here our uh, summary of the REO information that we had already completed our details of transactions, which will pull information from the good faith, uh, and then our declarations here, and then our government monitoring purpose uh, for, the, for the borrowers on the file. And then uh, along the bottom, we have the to be completed by loan originator section. What's really key here is that the information from your own user account as well as your branch will go ahead and populate here to be uh, automatically. So you don't have to fill this out every single time. It's going to take it from your account and your branch of information. Okay? Uh, and this really comes into play because it's pulling the information, you look here, uh, the populate from official contact loan officer option here. So really, um, you know, this is coming in from what we call the official contact list. And we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Uh, but at least you can see that it pulls in our NMLS, ID information and also our state licensing information as well. Okay, so let's see here. What's next on our agenda? Uh, let's take a look at 
Uh, you know, probably the next step in the process for you is going ahead and running pricing and eligibility on your file. So uh, if we jump back over here to the loan info folder, click on run price my loan. Uh, this here allows you to go ahead and uh, run uh, pricing on your file. So the price my loan engine is a pricing and automated underwriting engine. Uh, basically, it's not just giving you pricing results, but it's also determining eligibility for your files based on the information you've entered. The ten, some of the 1003, the credit report, and then also if you had run DO or LP on the file. And what that means is that because these things are being filtered out for eligibility, the types of loans that you're submitting over to your operations staff or the underwriter and processors to review is going to be a higher quality pop pipeline because it's already been determined that they qualify based on the guidelines and overlays for the products that we're uh, submitting over. Okay, so. Uh, this first step here is just my information, um, you know, that came from my account. The next step here uh, is the credit step. Uh, so if we hadn't ordered credit, um, you know, let's say if we had jumped right into the engine right away, uh, it would have brought us, uh, you know, given us ability to order credit if we wanted to. Now, one option uh, that I do want to point out here is that uh, your account may have this option, the ability to manually uh, enter credit report information. And so if we had chosen that option, that will allow us to go ahead and uh, enter the credit scores, um, enter the credit scores and late payment information, public record information, okay? And so this gives us a more accurate and better picture of what the borrower qualifies for uh, compared with the quick pricer, okay? Uh, so let's say maybe the borrower is not ready for you to pull credit on them just yet. Go ahead and use the uh, manual enter credit option instead. Okay, and so uh, let's see here. Aside from that, uh, if we went ahead and let's see here, I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss uh, mute someone there. Uh, aside from that, uh, we also have the ability to order, reissue, or upgrade that we saw already. But since I already ordered credit on this file, I'm gonna go ahead and use the credit report on the file there. Okay. So with this said, uh, if we go ahead and click on next. That will allow me to move over to the applicant step. And once again, since we already completed the 1003, a lot of this information and has already been filled out for us. Uh, basically, this applicant step it allows you to enter information if it wasn't already on the file. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, one other note we wanted to make is that um, you know if you manually entered credit information, uh, that will allow you to see the pricing and eligibility. But if you eventually want to actually submit a lock request through the engine, you would need to have a credit report on file. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, manual enter credit allows you to see information, but to actually submit, you'll need a credit report on file. Um, just click on next here again. Uh, this will take us to the property and loan. Again, if we completed 1003, a lot of this is already filled out for us. But we can go ahead and I'll just scroll down a little slowly here for us, uh, not jump too much. Uh, but you can enter more information on this particular property. Um, any items that have this red circle next to it indicates that it is required. So if I went ahead and chose, uh, let's say, two months reserved, that will allow me to go ahead and move forward uh, with the lock period. I've entered a 30-day uh, pricing. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Some other options that we have available. Uh, we have, uh, oh, if this is going to be an FHA or a VA loan, I do recommend having this item marked as finance. That way it will be used to determine the total loan amount on the file. Uh, this can also be defaulted in the template, so that might be something your administrators want to do for you. Um, if you don't go for an FHA loan, then it's fine. No harm, no foul, but uh, just something you might miss, uh, so just be aware of that particular option there. And then scrolling down even further here, you have the ability to select uh, what type of uh, AOS response uh, you want to use in terms of uh, eligibility for your prod products. So if you want to uh, assume, let's say, a DU approved eligible, go ahead and choose that, and that will go ahead and use that in assumed information to determine what you qualify for. But there will be a warning uh, letting the uh, underwriters and the operations know that uh, this hasn't been run through DO or DU or LP. Um, so uh, there will be indication that this was manually entered. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, one other option. Uh, the rest of the information down here 
is that the processing and filters and sorting area uh, allows us to determine what types of loans we want to see. Okay. All right. So if I click on Get Results here, uh, it will bring us to the pricing and eligibility results screen where we can go ahead and take a look at uh, what we qualify for based on the scenario we've entered. We had entered the 1003, we had ordered credit, and uh, we're assuming a DU approved eligible. I did not run it. So now I have my eligible programs here. Um, they're all, once again, uh, showing us according to product type. And we'll notice that this is actually doing a best execution result for us. Um, so basically, at each of these rate options, it's going to go ahead and show us, let me zoom in a little bit here, a little bit easier to see. Uh, it'll show us the best price at each rate option. In this case, for our 15-year fixed conforming product, uh, we have uh, from three and three quarters all the way to three and a quarter. Uh, Provident is actually giving the best price. Uh, all the way up from there, we have FAMC and DMAC as well. Okay. And so from here, um, once again, it does give you the best pricing at each of those rate options. As we scroll down, same thing for each of our different product types. Okay. But what's really neat, though, is along the bottom of the screen, we also have the ineligible uh, program section, which tells you what you don't qualify for, but also why you don't qualify for it. So it gives you uh, some more information in terms of uh, why you don't qualify, and the idea here is that uh, it minimizes the amount of calls or emails you will need to make to the operations staff because you have it right here. Hey, I don't qualify for Provident because for a purchase and no cash out loan, uh, for anything that has LTV greater than 75%, the minimum score is 700. I don't meet that or the scenario doesn't meet that. And it's really neat to look at this area because there might be something that is workable. Maybe it's a DTI issue. Maybe it's a reserves. You need you know, two more months reserves. Uh, that can be something that will be made available. Okay. And so uh, what happens in that case is that you might be able to go ahead and say, hey, if we can swing two more months reserves, let's go ahead. You'll contact the bar or just jump back here to step three. You can click on this blue uh, or this green link here or click on the go back button here, whatever you're closer to. And go ahead and modify, you know, your reserves available to from two months to four months, and then go ahead and rerun pricing based on that information. And it will go ahead and use that updated information to determine eligibility. So, uh, very key. Um, it's even helpful to look at the ineligible programs. Maybe it's a you know better investor or better program. Swing a, a couple more months reserves or whatever it is, and you'll go ahead and qualify for it. So pretty neat. Uh, you have the eligible programs there on the left, on the bottom there. Okay, so let me go ahead. Like I said, I'm just going to say this is uh, you know six, four months reserves now, and go ahead and get results. So uh, as we're getting to the pricing and uh, underwriting results uh, screen, um, another thing to mention is that uh, because we're doing that filtering, right? You saw how we are disqualifying certain pro products. Well, like I mentioned before, it's going to prevent those things from going to your underwriting pipeline. So they don't have to work on loans that we're not going to qualify for in the first place. Pretty neat. Uh, so what can you do here? Um, basically, uh, you'll have the ability to register uh, for a loan file or submit a lock request. Now, uh, your accounts will be set up so that you can't submit a lock request until a credit report is on file. But aside from those two options, we also have this preview link. If I click on preview, that will allow me to go ahead and, uh, let's see here, uh, allow me to preview information on this particular file. So as I look at this preview certificate, I have my scenario information. Okay, If I had a MLO comp plan on my account, I'd be able to see that information right here. Uh, if I scroll down even further, uh, I have the pricing information for uh, this particular program. Any visible adjustments are available right here. Okay, and then as I scroll down even further, um, I have my underwriting conditions and stipulations. Well, notice there are some warnings based on my, uh, yeah, I don't have a valid license in this particular subject property state. Uh, there are some two reserve uh, monthly payments here. Uh, let's see, some other warnings. And this is, you know, warnings for you as well as the, the underwriter. Um, we have credit warnings. I had marked, if you remember, some items that's paid off. So this is just saying, hey, these items a month that's paid off different than the credit report. So something that has to be verified. 
And then as we scroll down even further, we have a bunch of different PTD conditions, PTF conditions, and some other miscellaneous items. And so those things are in place to help you, uh, guide you as far as what else would be required in order to move forward with this particular loan file. Okay? So uh, with that, um, you'll be able to see what you need to gather. And it's pretty cool because uh, now you know what you need to gather, whether or not the borrower would be able to swing certain conditions. And since you know what you need to get, you can start the document gathering process right away. You don't have to wait for processing or underwriting to issue out a needs list because you have it right here. Okay. So just preview, you can see this. You can go ahead and email it to yourself for your record. You aren't doing anything. It's just seeing uh, some more information on this particular product. In order to move forward, okay, you'll want to go ahead and click on the register loan option. Okay, um, So register or submit lock, whichever is more appropriate for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and choose the register loan option because I want to show you uh, something cool. Uh, so you'll choose register loan for your desired rate option and it will bring you to a confirmation screen. So you have here, you can enter an estimated closing date if you wanted to. Uh, you'll notice that if there are any people associated with this particular file, it'll email them a copy of the certificate that will be generated. Okay, and so uh, with that, uh, you know I do recommend keeping all these checkboxes enabled. You can add a message to uh, operations here. Just go ahead and type in any other notes that you want to include, and then you have the warnings from the preview that we saw, and then you have this agreement, loan submission agreement. So this needs to be agreed to. You'll click on I agree, uh, click on confirm, and that will go ahead and allow you to register uh, this loan file uh, for this particular program. Okay, and so what happens at that point is that if there are any people that are assigned based on your account setting, uh, the uh, what will happen is that your um, those operations staff members will also receive a copy of the certificate. Okay, this is sent to your email, so you can see you have it for your record. That's also available in the file. Okay, and so what happens uh, at this point is that you know. I registered the file at any time if I wanted to submit a lock, okay, I can rerun pricing. And so back in the loan file, if I click on run price my loan, we'll notice that I'll be able to just go through those different screens and it will allow me to go ahead and rerun pricing. Right? I'll just jump through uh, the screens getting to the results. And now I can rerun pricing for the most up-to-date pricing on that program I had registered for. So now it's giving me the most up-to-date uh, information for the FAMC product I, I submitted for. I come back the next day, you know, a borrower says, yeah, that doesn't look good, you know, go ahead and, and uh, come back later, rerun pricing later on, and eventually you'll want to go ahead and submit that loss request. Okay, so if I went ahead and said, okay, I want to submit loss request, very, very similar process. We just say uh, it gives you the information on the lock along the top. I agree, confirm, and now you have a lock request that will be sent to you. And it says, you can see the difference here because as we scroll down towards the bottom, it says this is a lock request. Okay? It'll also highlight the rate option that you had chosen. Okay? Our visible adjustments there and then our, uh, how is it, our uh, conditions again. All right. So uh, what we have we done so far? We have taken the 1003. We have ordered credit. We have registered for a program. We had rerun pricing for locks. We had submitted a lock request. Um, some other things that we want to cover uh, before we end our time. We have about 15 more minutes in our scheduled time, so I appreciate uh, all the time you've given us so far. Uh, once again, if you have any questions about what we have done at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and ask those questions along the bottom of the screen. Okay, so what else do we have here? We have um, uh, the ability to uh, work on the GFP. So here on the Forms folder, if we click on the 2010 GFE link, this allows us to go ahead and uh, view the good faith estimate. So you enter the information here, and that will export out to DocMagic eventually. Okay. So as I scroll down, okay, uh, most of the time you'll want to use this populate from official contact and then use your own information Okay, as a loan officer. And so that way your information will populate here automatically. Okay. Uh, so you know, because it's already on the official contacts list, uh, you don't have to type it out. You know, uh, set manually and type it out. You can just pull it from whatever's already on the file. Okay, so populate info there, and then as we scroll down, uh, you have a variety of different. Um, you know, there might be these closing cost templates you can choose from. 
Uh, but as we scroll down, these already should be applied uh, based on the template to the file. So their standard keys should be here. And as you work your way down, you can see uh, you know, this area. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit so we can get a look at some of the other areas. Uh, very key thing to take a look at is you know you have your line items here like we saw earlier a percentage or a dollar amount will help determine uh, this amount that's going to go on the DFD uh, so very similar process you have these custom lines and it should already be defaulted based on the uh, templates that your administrators did so they did a good job on that uh, one thing I want to keep in mind here for our page 2 column is that hey you know what you're answering these fees but where are they appearing on the GFD well, you know, as you may know, the GFE page two has those different A1, A2 box, which are the origination fees, and then about B3 uh, through B11, or block three through block 11, are the other settlement charges. And that's exactly what this page two column is. Uh, so essentially, uh, those items that are origination charges belong to A1. Those items that are settlement charges belong to B3 you know, to whatever it is. Um, some of these custom fields here allow you to switch between the two, but this should already be configured uh, within the template, so you shouldn't have to modify uh, these custom items uh, that much, if at all. Okay. Uh, these items can be paid by the borrower, the seller, the lender, or the broker. Okay. And uh, also, uh, we'll notice that there's an A checkbox here. This is important because uh, this indicates that this is belonging to AP or this is an APR fee, okay? And so this uh, is already defaulted by the admins in the template, so you shouldn't have to type uh, or touch uh, these A checkboxes. It should already be there for you, okay? Uh, for FHA loans, you have, if it's an FHA closing cost, you have this F checkbox. Uh, once again, paid outside of closing or paid items, you'll mark those items there. And as we scroll down to the right, if it's being paid by the broker, uh, or pay to the broker, I should say. You can go ahead and select that B checkbox. It will go ahead and populate that there. And then as you can also see, you have a paid to column, which allows you to type in who this is being paid out to, and that will print out on the DFD. Some of these items have already been defaulted based on our template. Okay, aside from going ahead and previewing, um, aside from going ahead and previewing these guys, uh, within Lenders Office, you actually have the ability to go down here and take a look at the uh, DFE summary. So all of those particular items, in terms of what they're um, what they are uh, populating to um, your block nine, block eleven, etc., is summarized down here. And then you also have your trade-off tables and shopping cart information, where you'll be able to enter that information all the way all the way on the bottom uh, of the screen here. Okay. So that's the area for the GFC, allows you to go ahead and take a look at that. And this is what's going to be exported out to DocMagic. Okay. So um, let's see, some other item I do want to point out here is that if there is a credit or charge right, uh, for obtaining this loan, you'll want to indicate that in line 802. If it is a charge, you'll put in, let's say if they're paying 1% uh, to obtain this loan, you'll go ahead and put in 1% there. If it is a credit, um, you know, you'll put in a negative number, and that will go ahead and um, be reflected as a credit on uh, page two. Basically, it will select the checkbox uh, number two on uh, page two block two. Okay. So with this said, um, you know, there's other information. We'll take a quick look here at Truth and Lending before we jump into the Doc Magic area. Uh, but this Truth and Lending screen allows you to do just review. Uh, you know, if the ARM information was on the file, it would be here. If you had chosen the ARM program, uh, this information would be populated as well. You have your amortization schedule if you want to take a look at that. And just scroll in, scroll down. Uh, you have all this uh, mortgage insurance, prepayment information. Um, and then the rest of the stuff on the bottom here for the sales should already be defaulted in your template. But just want to point out that this is where you can fill out that information. Okay, and that will be carried over to DocMagic. Um, yeah. So here, if this was an interest-only loan, you want to go ahead and answer how many uh, months it is interest-only, interest-only payments here. And that should just about do it for us for now. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at how you can export this out to DocMagic to generate those docs in case, you know, that's part of your responsibility since each of the branches does things a little differently. All right, so uh, instead of the services folder here, there is a DocMagic link. And if I click on that, 
it allows me to go ahead and export out to Doc Magic. So if I click on this button, uh, what happens is I'll be able to enter my Doc Magic customer ID, username, and password information. Notice the web sheet number is new, means that this has not been exported out to Doc Magic yet. If I had done this uh, earlier, uh, it would actually have the Doc Magic web sheet number here instead. Okay. Uh, some options that are available depending on your account settings, you might be able to change this information, but for the most part, I'm thinking you won't be. It's just saying that you'll be exporting out the 2010 GSE information to generate the uh, initial uh, disclosures inside of Doc Magic. Um, if you had already exported out to Doc Magic at some point and you wanted to go ahead and just uh, excuse me, and you wanted to go ahead and just uh, view the information in Doc Magic without exporting the data, there's this button here, Launch Doc Magic Applet. If you can see, it's a little grayed out for now. Uh, but this allows you to launch Doc Magic without having to re-export information from Lender's Office. So this button on the left will uh, export and override whatever information is in Doc Magic. The button on the right here allows you just to open up the existing Doc Magic information. Okay. Uh, some other options here that we want to go over uh, as we close out. Uh, about ten more minutes. We're coming down to the end of our training. Uh, we want to take a look at the status folder here. You click on general. Something that you know it's just going to be good for you to know anyways is that you know as this file is moving through the process, you'll be able to go here to the general screen and see the different dates that are in place. Okay, when I registered for this file, it automatically uh, you know put it into the registered status. But as this file is moving forward, uh, you know you'll see different dates populate here. And if you were uh, let's say responsible for moving this over to a different status, um, you know you can go ahead and just you know, click on this lock checkbox on the top, and let's say you're going to move it to processing. Click on change status, and then uh, whatever status you want to change it to, uh, go ahead and choose it from this list. So if I had clicked on the processing option here, that will place it into the processing status and uh, populate today's date if there uh, hasn't been a date already entered on the file. Okay, um, I think I might lose access if I move it to processing, so I'm going to go ahead. <coughs> and uh, not do that. Um, I'm getting some notes here that I may be disconnected or might be some connection issues with GoToWebinar. So I'm going to go ahead and hold off from moving forward until uh, that message goes away. So I apologize for that. Okay, you should be able to see everything again. Um, I'm getting some uh, some indications that people are still frozen, maybe back on that Doc Magic screen. Let's take a look here. I'm just going to see if there's any issues there. Let's see. So, if you guys want to go ahead and uh, just enter a real quick chat session, uh, let me know if you can see or not see uh, the status screen where you see all the different statuses. Please let me know, and then. Um, if not, uh, I'll hold off before moving forward. Apologize for the technical uh, issue again. Okay, and while we're waiting, uh, just for a confirmation there from you guys, uh, I'll go ahead and just take a look at some of your questions. Uh, one question, uh, is there a way to work offline uh, in Leonard's office? Good question. Uh, it is a web-based system, so in order to access the files, uh, you would need to be uh, connected via the internet. Okay, that way, as you're saving changes, other people can see your information. As other people are saving changes, uh, you'll be able to see the most updated information as well. So you do need to be connected online. Okay. Okay. Uh, are you guys able to see the uh, status area now, or are you still on the Doc Magic area? Uh, Michael or, or uh, Adam? Still on good old Doc Magic export. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to try to just refresh that again.
Okay, so you might be seeing some blue screens like we were doing earlier. Okay, just taking a look at other questions while we're waiting for the frozenness to come out, while we're waiting for GoToMeeting to thaw, I guess. So I can see a bunch of you guys are still on the Docmatic screen. Apologize for that again. Okay, so uh, while we're waiting for you guys to kind of refresh in terms of what you're seeing, uh, let's go ahead and just talk a little bit about some of the support uh, that you'll have access to uh, inside of Lawyer's Office. Now, for those of you that may have already been given access, you might have already started using this. Uh, but along the upper right corner of Lender's Office, uh, there are a few links that you'll be able to use. Uh, one is the instant support option uh, that allows you to uh, the instant support option allows you to chat live with our support team uh, from 6:30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. And that will uh, give you the ability to just chat back and forth with our team. Uh, there's also a uh, help, uh, sorry, a question feedback link which allows you to email our team as well uh, for any information. Um, that allows you to go ahead and you'll get a tracking number and we'll be able to respond to you via email. And then there's also a help link that allows you to uh, view uh, our help center, which gives you access to a bunch of different user guides. Um, user guides and other uh, goodies, uh, update history of the system is updated uh, fairly regularly, usually once a month. Uh, for some of our bigger releases, it might take a little bit longer, but uh, usually at least once a month. Um, and that allows you to see, um, uh, that will allow you to see, uh, you know, the latest updates and, and just new features that are available to you, okay? So I'm getting an uh, uh, indication here that you're able to see the uh, status area, I hope. Hey, Master, I'll please see, uh, we cited the LBQ training, loan officer, I sir, kind of like the page before you start showing the screen. I see, I see. Okay, uh, let me just refresh here, and I think it might take a little bit for it to come back up. Uh, kind of like what you saw before where you saw a little blue, little mouse, and then eventually the pipeline screen. So uh, let's go ahead and just give this a little um, uh, a moment to come up for us. Okay. Uh, one question from Mary, uh, Michael or Adam. Uh, what's the deadline that everyone will be on the lender's office? Uh, we don't have any firm deadline. We obviously want to transfer everybody over you know, as fast as possible, but we want to have it make it a smooth transition. Uh, we get everybody in um, by the end of September. I think we would uh, we have done a good job. Okay, I Excellent. can see now the status screen. All right, how about mouse? Mouse moving? Moving like the colors of the wind. All right, all right, Pocahontas, let's go. So uh, with these, uh, once again, I clicked on change status button. And now I can just choose what status I want to change it to. So if you're passing it over to processing, for example, you can go ahead and click the processing link there. And I'll place it into the processing status. Okay. So that's uh, the status area where you can change the status here. Uh, another thing I want to show you uh, before we are up on our time, uh, I do respect your time and, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, the agent screen here allows you to go ahead and reassign the loan file. Uh, to other uh, you know, folks if you needed to. So if I wanted to you know, explicitly assign this to a processor, for example, uh, you can click on that assign link and you'll be able to choose from uh, your appropriate processor in the, in the list. Okay. And then along the bottom here, what's neat is that this is that contact list, official contact list we were talking about, uh, basically allows you to populate different forms and disclosures with the information here. Okay. So it's really cool because it saves you the amount of data entry you have to do on a bunch of forms because it just comes and pulls from this area. All right. So um, with that said, uh, just to show you those links, instant support here, you'll be able to chat back and forth with our team, like I mentioned. Uh, feedback question allows you to email us. 
Um, let's see here. I, what time is it? Okay. So you ask a question here and do a little chat back and forth, feedback question, email us, and then help center is that uh, particular area we were talking about. User guides, update history, and all that. Okay. Let's see. Just taking a quick look at our proposed agenda. Um, I think that just about does it in terms of what we wanted to cover today. Uh, Michael or Adam, is there anything else you wanted to talk about uh, as we close out of our session? No, I think one thing, just to go over real quick, is just to show the printing. We have a bunch of custom forms. We can build any custom forms for your branch or for our needs, but we no longer are going to have to be able to use systems to manually fill out forms. We can quickly build forms, all of the data is in the loan file, and have them auto-populate onto any type of form we want when we build those into the custom print group. So um, that's something that's going to be a great feature and a, and a saver as well. So it's really the only other thing I wanted to show. Sure. And so uh, well, I'll just click on the print button at the very, very top there. Okay. And this area um, for the print screen allows us to access those different forms and disclosures that are available. Well, I should say forms that are available in Lent Office. We know that for initial disclosures, those are all going through DocMagic, okay? So don't uh, generate them here and, and uh, uh, distribute them from Lenders Office. You want to go through DocMagic so you can take advantage of the eSign uh, e-delivery uh, kind of feature. So with that said, um, we have our print screen where we can take a look at all the different forms here. Uh, you can, if you wanted to just look at the custom forms that they had created for you, you can click on custom PDF forms here. And that will allow you to uh, basically filter out all those other forms that are on the uh, that they had uh, not created. So this allows you to see the change of circumstance, stock fee sheet, etc. And so what's neat, like Michael mentioned, is that these forms can pull information directly from the loan file uh, without having uh, you know uh, you don't have to fill it out afterwards as long as the information is on the loan. Okay. Uh, were there any particular forms you wanted to take a look at here, uh, Michael? No. Nope. Letting them know they're all there. Your doc fee sheet uh, will be there when you're ready to draw a doc. Your any of the other information, loan submission sheets for processing, uh, will be used there. Er, er, any form that we currently use that we hand type that's just long and cumbersome and sealed that we they're all in the system. Let's just automate it and make life better for everybody. Yeah. So if I click on the preview link for any of these fees or any of these forms. I can open this up in my uh, PDF software, uh, you know, your Adobe Reader or whatever you're using, and that will allow you to go ahead and uh, review uh, these forms. Okay, so you can see it populates my information that was on the file onto this form. Yeah, so minimizing the amount of information you have to enter. Okay, if you wanted to print these out directly, uh, you can actually select the checkbox here uh, for you know doc fee sheet or whatever you're trying to print out. Uh, and then if you wanted to go ahead and, and preview these in Adobe first, you can click on this button where you can uh, open it up in PDF or save it onto your computer. Or if you want to print directly from Lenders Office, you can click on this Print Selected Forms button here. And really that allows you um, to print, send them directly to your printer. Uh, you don't have to preview them in, in Adobe or anything first. Uh, so in order to use that print option there, uh, one thing I do want to uh, talk about as we jump back to our pipeline screen here, is uh, this your settings area along the up on the left side of the screen. <clears throat> this your settings area allows you to click on the download link, uh, where you'll be able to access the browser XT uh, option. This browser XT is required uh, for you to install in order to import or export forms. Uh, also, if you're working with any of those custom word forms, and then ePrint V4 allows you to print forms directly from Lenders Office. And uh, so these two, just you know, just cover your bases. You probably want to do that on your computer. And it's really not anything to do with accessing or, or working on the files, but if you do need to take stuff out of the system or put stuff into it, uh, you would need this so that your computer can uh, uh, talk with Lenders Office. Okay. Uh, something else I do want to just show you since we're here, if you ever wanted to, let's say, update your information, uh, there's a your profile link there and you can update your information, your name, contact information, your password here. Um, you know, there's some uh, electronic signature features that are available as well. Um, you're not going to be using that for now, uh, but just, you know, letting you know that's available. 
Uh, and then if you want to just review your own settings, your access level or roles or permissions or anything like that, you can go ahead and take a look uh, at what's available here. Okay. So uh, with that, some questions. Uh, let's see, are there fields to keep track of file contacts such as title, escrow, selling agents? Good question. Um, that area within the loan file is in this agent screen. So if you wanted to add, let's say, a title or appraiser, whatever it is, you can click on Add People. Okay. And so, um, you know, if you have access to read from the contacts database, you can click on this Pick from Contacts link here. And that will allow you to pick and choose from any appraisers that are currently on the file. Uh, and currently in the contact database. So you'll be able to choose from that list, just click on select and I'll uh, populate that information here. Okay. Now if you have access to add to contact, you can also click on this link here that will allow you to add uh, information to the database. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be available for you. Uh, if it isn't, that just means that you'll have to forward your request to add a contact to the database to an administrator and they'll be able to do that for you. Just to help keep the uh, contact database clean. Let's see here. Uh, is there a light version that we can access from a PDA, iPhone, or Android phone? Good question. And someone also asked, uh, does this work with Safari and Firefox? Uh, another good question. In order to access the lender's office and the price my loan engine that we've been taking a look at today, you do need to be working on a, uh, a computer that has Internet Explorer. So you do have to use the Internet Explorer web browser uh, just due to some of the technologies that are used uh, to uh, you know, make everything work. So you do need to use Internet Explorer if you have a Mac uh, computer, an Apple computer. Uh, you know, for you know some of those Macs, they have uh, kind of a dual boot system where you can load up uh, a Windows installation uh, to access the Internet Explorer web browser. So it is possible, uh, not directly uh, from the Safari web browser, but you would need to boot up Windows to access Internet Explorer, and then you'll be able to use the system from there. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I'll leave it open for uh, a few minutes if we see some activity on the question side. Uh, feel free to ask them. Um, and so yeah, that's all for now. Questions to see if you want to hang out a little bit longer. Lester's here to answer them. Um, great job, Lester. Sorry, you know, go to meeting. We can slap them. Little technical difficulties here and there. We will kind of work through them. There is a, an additional processor training tomorrow to kind of go over the same thing. If any loan officers want to be on that, it's open to them as well. The more uh, exposure you have to the system, the better. Uh, this is just the first start. Lender's office is very robust. You, there, we will be using a paperless system inside a lender's office. You will be able to see the loan at all times, anytime you're logged into the site in the future. You'll be able to upload your picture. Your borrowers can go on the site, upload the documents. There's uh, endless capabilities here that we're just scratching the surface on. Um, didn't want to overwhelm too many. We're taking it slow. We are going to be building out much more functionality so and rolling out. So with that, thank you, Lester, very much today. If there's any other questions, um, don't see any myself. Have a great day, everybody, and get some more loans. End of the month here. Get things funded out for everybody. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so I'll hang out for a bit for any questions. Um, and so if you wanted to go ahead and, and get going, uh, you're more than welcome to. So thanks, everyone. Uh, let's see, some questions. Uh, can you walk us through DO and DU? Good question. Uh, if you were to be responsible for uh, running DO or DU on the file, uh, as you can see here on the upper left corner, inside of the file folder, there is a submit to DODU link. And if I click on that, it brings me to uh, basically the Fannie Mae addendum screen where I can enter any additional information for DODU. Uh, if this is a brand new file, uh, you know, there's not going to be a case ID. If you had already uh, imported, uh, ran this through DO, uh, or imported a file that was run through DO already, it would have the case ID here. Okay. And then just scrolling down along the bottom, uh, if you were running it through, uh, let's say, DO specifically, right? Because there's different credentials for desktop originator and desktop underwriter. If I click on this button here for submit to desktop underwriter, or originator, I'm sorry. And just give me a moment here. Looks like we have someone on the line. Okay, 
So once I click on that button, uh, we'll be able to enter my DO user ID and password. Okay. For the most part, this can be left alone. Uh, they'll populate automatically when you import. Uh, but I enter my credentials here and click on submit. And that will open a brand new file for us uh, where we can see um, where we'll be able to access the DO website. So it's basically taking your information, exporting it to the DO website, and you'll be working in DO just like you are uh, should already be familiar with. Okay. Now, um, I won't be able to show you the exact demo here right now, but uh, on our help center here, if I click on the help link along the upper right corner, uh, we have a tutorials area. Okay, so once I click on that tutorials area here, that will allow me uh, or allow you uh, to go ahead and take a look at some of our uh, animated tutorials. In this case, the direct DO and DO integration is what we're looking at. And go ahead and click on one of these uh, larger, small version links, and that will bring you uh, to a video that you'll be able to watch online. Uh, outlines the entire process, basically um, exporting it to DO, running it through DO, getting the findings, and then eventually importing all that information in the 1003, the credit report, and the DO findings. Okay. Um, for those of you that are still on the line here, um, one thing we can take a look at in the underwriting folder, if we click on conditions, uh, any conditions that are on the file uh, that were generated from Price My Loan or even from DO or whatever it is will be available here on this condition screen. Now, you won't be able to modify them, but you can at least see what's going on on the file. So as underwriters are going in and clearing these conditions, you'll see that this date done column will be uh, cleared. They'll have a date as well as the underwriter that cleared it. Um, they'll even be able to add notes here for each of these conditions. So Maybe they have received the condition, but still reviewing, still on the review. They can add updates here so that um, basically instead of you having to call them and, and or email them about a certain condition, uh, you can just look here inside of the uh, file and say, well, you know, um, find a good one. Let's see, blood cert, is that in? Is that being reviewed? You know, et cetera. So, you can uh, take a look at those notes areas for updates to those conditions, unless they're cleared entirely as well. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you, when the underwriters clear conditions, the system will automatically um, email you. Uh, basically, will compile the conditions every hour, and so uh, you'll receive an email um, within an hour if conditions have been cleared, uh, indicating that you know for this file, these certain conditions were uh, marked as completed. So that's pretty neat, and that's something that goes out to you as loan officers. Okay, for anyone else on the phone, um, feel free to ask any other questions here. Still hanging out for a bit. 